great visual effects artists are all about creating interactions between live action and what is created in the computer. In animation, you end up being more painterly. You have very specific control over what you want in front of the camera. Give our young audience some advice if they're thinking of pursuing film or VFX or animation. Make something with what you have in front of you, um, whatever you can. The first film I made was with Lego stop motions in my backyard, and I actually didn't even know there was stop motion. I thought there was an effect in the computer that you could drag and drop and it would instantly remove hands. You know, this industry is kind of tough and it's very rewarding in terms of personal fulfillment. If you're good at your craft, you will, you will make money or even more money than many other positions out there and occupations. There are a lot of people that either talk down to art or just diminish what art does for society. And you know, when you're creating things and you care about it, your gifts will be taken and inspire other people. So how has the cinema changed in style? I think people would be shocked to realize how many visual effects shots that are in movies that you don't even know exist. Welcome to Mad Artist Publishing, the place to be for short films, VFX, animated shorts, and interviews with directors and animators that create. Welcome to Mad Artist Publishing, I'm your host, Marcin Migdal, and today we welcome Blake Rizzo. Blake is the director and a visual effects artist of the award-winning short film Lux that is making its way around film festivals and he is also the founder of the Lux Film Production Club for students, cinematographers and other professionals who work together to make productions. Welcome Blake and thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you for having me. So tell me how you got involved in the industry. I've been making films since sixth grade. I started out with Lego stop motions and then eventually around middle school I moved into live action. But then when I moved into live action, I wanted that sense of building things uh, that I had with stop motion. So I started learning visual effects to kind of uh, augment reality and create uh, live action films with whatever the heck I want um, by using the powers of visual effects that be. What age did you actually start getting involved with this? So maybe, so I'm 23 now, so maybe when I was 13 or 14. The night that I started learning visual effects, I remember the night very well. I was watching an industrial light and magic documentary, Creating the Impossible. It was uh, uh, narrated by Tom Cruise. And it basically was talking about industrial light and magic and the history of Star Wars and, and everything that led to how visual effects became where they are today. Um, and I remember getting so inspired by that that I went upstairs that very night. Um, and instead of doing my homework, I searched up 3D software uh, and I discovered Blender. Uh, which Blender is a free 3D software that um, is really, really powerful. And then I immediately was like, holy crap, this is, this is possible. I can, I can create these things. And then I remember, I think like even just like getting ready for bed that night, taking a shower and like, looking in the bathroom, looking at like the tiles and like, oh, look at how it interacts with light. Look at how this interacts with this. I could build this all in the computer and do these things. And then that's where it kind of all started. Um, and from there on, I started learning visual effects software. Um, and gradually over the time, I building up the software. I think my English teacher gave me After Effects for the first time. She gave me the software and I started learning After Effects with Blender, doing like little action film tests, and then gradually going that direction ever since that day. Wow, so you're definitely self-taught, would you say? Uh, the only um, filmmaking related classes that I had it, were in high school and 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 some, and in college, but there, there weren't very many of them because I didn't actually major in uh, film production specifically. A lot of the things I, I learned was through studying my favorite films and uh, looking at, to, you know, After Effects tutorials like Video Copilot, basically learning through doing over a long period of time and lots of trial and error, and then also learning from other people. Um, and then, you know, having that environment to, of people that inspire me and also my friends to uh, we make things together. What would you say are the top three characteristics that make up a good visual effects artist or an animator? So animator is all about creating the illusion of life. Visual effects allows you to, if you apply it into live action, if that's what you're talking about, if you're compositing computer generated elements into live action footage, it allows live action footage to take on qualities of animation. Because the difference between um, traditional film, which where it's mi mise en scene, where you're placing things in front of the camera, um, is that sometimes accidents can happen. In animation, you end up being more painterly. You have very specific control over what you want in front of the camera, and it's more like a painter versus a person that stages things in front of them, which is just you know shooting live action film um, or TV. Um, and essentially, when you put live action in in with visual effects you have this in between and the only great visual effects artists are all about creating interactions between live action 
and what is created in the computer. So I think, you know, if you're looking for three characteristics, I think a person who has a really, really uh, observant uh, studying the world around you, how it interacts, how do roots of a tree react with light, how do characters move uh, and being observant. And then the second one is having this drive to tell stories, uh, not, not being obsessed with the idea of things, but actually being in love with the process of actually making it because visual effects is very time consuming. But then once you kind of accept that and you're like, wow, I get to really enjoy the details, then that's where it starts to become fun. And then the, the third is to always create something with what you have in front of you and then gradually more so down the line, continuously create and you will, um, you will get better. And then also uh, learn storytelling, learn the purpose and how and why your visual effects are incorporated into the story and how you can use visual effects to invoke the story. Because if, if people are confused about the story, people are going to not necessarily care about all the time that you spent. Like, I want my visual effects to support this. Because once you have a great story, then the great story promotes everything within itself. Your focus and your strengths are probably on storytelling, right? Because as you said, VFX is supplementary to the story. Everything is, is supplementary, but visual effects provide opportunities to create worlds beyond resources that you have in front of you. I learned visual effects from the writing perspective. So it, I, it's not just, I need to know the idea but I also need to know the execution. Um, I need to be able to execute the ideas that I dream up in my head. Um, and, and part of that is learning visual effects and learning how can I actually create these things. So without visual effects, I couldn't make this story of, you know, the Voyager crashing down to another planet, like, cause that, that involves visual effects. So it allows you to kind of extend off of your reality and, uh, allow yourself to do things that you wouldn't be able to do. Not all stories require visual effects, but um, I think people would be shocked to realize how many visual effects shots that are in movies that you don't even know exist. I mean, that is the, uh, the ultimate for the VFX artist when you know that something looks real but really isn't. Uh, for anybody who, who's not been to university and taken uh, cinema studies, can you shed some light on what can people expect from attending a course similar to the one that you've taken? Cinema media studies at the University of Washington is, is basically studying film and writing about film. It's studying the history of cinema from its origins, from when the silent film days back in the late 18th century, like, you know, 1890s, uh, to the very first silent films. It's basically what, you, what we call today a stock footage, where it's just, oh, I'm just going to film a, a train coming at the screen. If you remember that from Hugo, uh, there's a famous story that, or myth or story or something that where uh, the first time uh, something was filmed, a train went towards the screen and the audience dove out of the way because they thought it was going to crash into that. No, I never heard that story. Uh, it, it's a, it, it, so it's a, one of the big first stories of cinema. So. It goes from all the way from its beginnings to uh, where it is today. Uh, you go through all the movements, neorealism, French New Wave, Japanese cinema. I did, uh, I did a class on Bollywood and, uh, Hollywood and Bollywood and like kind of, uh, so it kind of, I did a class on sound and cinema. So it's all kind of reading, reading and writing a lot about cinema and a lot about like cinematic theory. Um, and it, it can get pretty dense sometimes because there are times where I was watching like three films in a day and some of these films are, are slower paced to what we're used to right now because what it's really trying to do is you're trying to understand and this is great for if you like for any filmmaker understanding what all have what has cinema done before what what are the the, the abilities and, and what has it done before because then you can inform how you make things today so how has the cinema changed in style based on your knowledge then say all the way from the beginning to now it, overall the, the pacing has has uh slightly gotten a little bit faster but i also think that certain filmmaking tendencies and styles uh, of for example uh spielberg lucas and uh scorsese they were and and coppola they were new hollywood filmmakers the godfather was a big one jaws jaws invented the summer blockbuster which is what which is, you know informed the way that all movies are are advertised for today. Star Wars was another, you know, pivotal one in bringing a lot of people to go see movies. It's really hard to kind of get specific because if anything, cinema media studies has taught me, what lens are you analyzing cinema through? What are you, uh, different cinematic movements, how have they influenced what they have today? I think that Quentin Tarantino has done a very good job. It seems that he's reinvented cinema, uh, starting with Reservoir Dogs and onto Pulp Fiction. And then he's transitioned over 
especially with the Once Upon a Hollywood. And this is the general suggestion I think I have for just anyone is to watch a lot of movies. I was just watching the, I just, uh, for my birthday was a few days ago. I, I got the, yeah. Thank you. I got the Martin Scorsese masterclass and he was talking about basically watch a lot of films throughout history and that will inform what you respond to and what you love is what you'll try to channel into your own work. And Tarantino loves to kind of pay homage to all the movies that made him. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is basically what happens if this time in Hollywood before the Manson murders what if the Manson murders never happened, spoilers, and this time in Hollywood could live on forever? Because it was after that, that um, after the Manson murders, it, 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 it greatly affected the industry and the types of movies and how movies were made, because mm. it, it, that, that's what the movie was kind of all, it was like, hey, maybe we could stay in this fantasy forever. Uh, maybe, you know, this could end happily and Sharon Tate could live on her life for longer. And what happened, what, what are the movies that uh, Rick Dalton and... Sharon Tate would make together, you know, what, what would happen if this bad event never happened that changed right. the way Hollywood makes, or, you know, the nature of the... What three films would you recommend any want-to-be filmmaker to watch? Oh, man, this is such a hard question. Um, uh, I love 2001 Space Odyssey. I love Kiki's Delivery Service. Star Wars and Spirited Away, those are like some of my most favorite films. Do you ever rewatch movies over and over? Or do you get sick of them? A absolutely. If I get really, really excited, I usually rewatch it. Um, and I rewatch it and I do structural like analysis. And I try to understand what they were thinking when they made the film. I try to imagine conversations that they were having when they were making the film. What were they thinking that made them do this scene? Um, why is it structured the way it is and how does the structure mirror the emotion that you feel? You are a director of the sci-fi fantasy short film Lux. Where do I come from? us about the story and how it came to be. Lux is the story of the discovery of uh, NASA's Voyager 1 record. The film doesn't have any dialogue, right? Only like two lines of dialogue. Now, why did you choose to do that? To preface this, um, in 1977, uh, NASA launched uh, Voyager 1 and 2. These were probes that were designed to explore the outer solar system. And basically these probes were like Hail Marys. They just chuck them into space and they're never going to see them again. They had this idea of let's put a vinyl record, like a golden vinyl record, and let's make a compilation of sounds, images, uh, and music of Earth. Everything to represent Earth. Was that a real thing? Oh yeah, it's totally a real thing. And then so the, the audio that, you, that is featured in the film, that's real? So I have in front of me, this is the, uh, the Voyager record on uh, vinyl. Um, the actual sounds and everything. Um, and the thing that, that's hilarious about it is most of the music and the images on the actual record are copyrighted. I, which is hilarious because you send this thing out into space. It's like, oh, what are they going to do? The, 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 they're going to go sue the aliens for using their, using their stuff. Um, 
like they're gonna that's gonna promote space travel i don't know um but basically the thing that's not copyrighted because nasa's uh all public domain their government company all the voices all the greetings so this record has greetings from like 75 different languages um and they shot this thing into space and this is currently the it's currently the furthest thing from earth right now we can't know how much of the records they would understand but being much more advanced scientists and engineers than we otherwise they'd never be able to find and retrieve the small silent spacecraft in interstellar space essentially why there's no dialogue in the film why there's not very many is because it doesn't really need it i, I didn't like how it fit into the universe of the thing um and the thing about like boiling it down to just two lines of dialogue those are the only two ones that you need and then the only other dialogue you hear in the rest of the film is the record so i i didn't get into film school so i decided that i need to make a film that challenges the living hell out of me um uh <laughs> that's what i did and it hurt uh it was fun though um and, and rewarding and challenging because i want to make a film that was very very personal and very very heartfelt to me it lux being latin for light it's about the visual storytelling the movie is about the discovery of the voyager record what happens when it crashes into another planet and someone discovers it and this this uh person that discovers it her name is lux and she doesn't know where she comes from and she feels a little bit lonely and insignificant because of it um and she discovers the voyage record and it makes her feel a little bit less lonely because the universe feels a little bit less quiet because it's like hey there's something out there to connect to lux doesn't know where she comes from because she fell from space it's a fantasy movie kind of like superman yeah like superman style except she's like on this like blue orb thing uh so like 2001 space baby style of just impacts the ground the movie has a lot of visual effects for day for night um we shot during the day and i used visual effects to make it look like nighttime this was because we were chased by coyotes when we were filming mm. and none of the actors or nobody wanted to film at night anymore so literally that very night i had to completely reschedule our entire week uh to film during the day and i was like okay i think i can do this um and we ended up doing day for night uh and that's basically what became the look of the film um the actual where the observatory actually is is a ski lodge um at Mount Bachelor Oregon um so basically everything you see where the mountains are are exactly where they would be in real life what hardware and software specifically was used in the creation of the film the software that was used in the film after effects blender maya i cut it on premiere because premiere and after effects have a glorious relationship we modeled most of the things in maya however um there's some shots in the film that used blender cuz blender has a great landscape generator i can generate mountains and then i texture that so there's some shots that have fully cg environments where everything is cg in the in the screen but what about uh, shooting the cameras the lenses and so everything was created on my macbook the camera was the sony a7s mark 2 um the lens was a one of the g series lenses that had a it was a up up like it had a zoom built in so then i could go from it was like a digital mechanical zoom that was a kind of big beefy lens that could zoom like mechanically forward and backwards um steadily and then it was like a 22 to like 140 mm lens um and that's what we use for shooting we also use a ronin for stabilization and then a dji phantom 3 i think for the drone shots which were all all the all the stuff was shot in and around central oregon okay and was did you have a budget for the film or i'm assuming it was self funded we did in digogo and we raised about $845 i thought you're going to say the 145,000 <laughs> that that's the next one <laughs> sign the check um the uh $845 and the rest of it i funded in total it went to $2,000 Wow, that is very very good. That's a very low budget. Very low budget. Um and most of the money went towards equipment rentals. The actors were all met through the University of Washington. Uh the friends were a mix of University of Washington friends from the club and that uh, that I'll talk to you about in a bit. And the, basically from friends from the club and from my high school actually. Um the record prop that you see in the film was laser cut by my friend Cindy who's currently working at SpaceX. Wow. Um, the observatory was shot in at University of Washington we got permission from the astronomer uh, League of Astronomers club on campus uh, to shoot in this observatory. So now that it's all done and and then you can't go back, what would you change if you could redo this whole thing from the beginning? The film still proves something. It still evokes an emotion. It still proves something emotionally. But the thing I think could be better about it is I wish the first act could be expanded. I want to see Lux be a more active character. Um throughout the entire film she 
watch he watches things happen and then is moved inspired by them mm. um, but i want to see more of her life and i really really want to make that film it is to see more of what things are going on the more of a first act before the voyager falls so that's that's what i would want to see and that's what i want to write and that's what i am writing yeah so what's uh, what's next for you in terms of the, your next feature so the other thing about this is post-production of the film took two years wow this is just me doing visual effects Wow. Uh, visual effects and music. Um, and this was at the background of college. So it, it, it's like co college was going at the same time. So it's not like, like full time. I'm right. luxing. There are shots in the film that were completely or parts of the film that were completely written in post-production. For example, when she discovers the Voyager, when the Voyager first falls in the film, um, it cuts. I was able to use visual effects to bridge shots that I shot at sunset, green screen, midday. And at sunset so all these shots are from different places and i was able to use editing to make it work you're referring to the scene where the uh the voyager's coming down on the landscape and there's the trees and then there's that little explosion yeah i, I like telling this story because it's it, it tells you the, literally the power of editing um and about the power of what a shot can do and so basically the shot where it's falling down uh the voyager's falling down that was shot at sunset even though in the movie it's at sunrise you won't wouldn't tell you can't tell shot. We actually shot that shot just because it was cool when we were shooting it, but it ended up becoming really, really important for, for the film. And then the camera movement that you see in the shot was all created in post. So I took the shot, put it on a plane and then animated the camera movement and then digitally extended the field. So then it looked like the camera was basically tracking with the Voyager as it falls. Um, and then the shots after that, when she gets up and reacts to it, that was shot on a green screen about, six to eight months later wow um and then the shot where she goes down and opens her bag and puts the lantern in the bag those were shot on two completely different days and the thing that she actually throws in her bag in that shot is the object she was holding in the first stargazing scene wow. which was a gun let's talk about the locks production club i started the club at first because when i was applying to schools as a high schooler um applying to colleges i actually didn't get into a film school and I was like, okay, now I need to somehow find a way to make this work for myself um, in some way, shape or form. And I, I chose to go to UW and I was like, but UW doesn't have any filmmaking school, like class. It's not a film school. It doesn't have the resources or the institution or the infrastructure to be a film school. Um, so that's why I was like, okay, I need to create a group of people where I can meet people to make films. I need to create like a group of friends. They were serious about filmmaking as much as you were. Right, right. They're, they're serious. And then, uh, you know, also the, the love of like, you know, meeting friends in college. The, the slogan of the club is uh, Lux Film Production Club, meet people, make films. We make uh, around four uh, short films every single quarter. The short films are showed at the end of the quarter. We have a, and at each end of the quarter, we have a little bit of a screening and then we post them up on our YouTube channel. But within the club, we try to teach the actual uh, film, like film set roles, uh, how to organize these film shoots, all the different roles of what composes a film. It's a mini film school. It's just different people will put in different amounts of effort into the thing that they do. But I always try to make things that encourage people to push themselves, care about the films that you make, really, really care about them and, and really care about the story and, and, and try to do something that excites people. Because I personally get inspired by other people's energy and their passion. Uh, so likewise, when the production itself is like, hey, we're going to make Lux. It's this, it's this like ambitious visual effects story with, you know, the crash of the Voyager. We're going to go out to Oregon. We're going to make costumes. We're going to have an original soundtrack. We're going to, you know, write uh, lyrical songs. We're going to make this thing feel, make this thing really big. And But then you scale back. You're like, we made this for like $2,000. That gets people really, really excited because it just, it feels so much more accessible to them, you know, when people are first you know, watching movies or see, uh, dreaming of a, how the hell do I even make films on that scale that you see at the theaters, you're like, oh man, that, that life feels so far away. We could take all of the techniques that they do and we could boil it and still apply the learning lessons on what we do. And the only difference is budget and scale. So what is next then for Lux Production Club or for your career, for your next film? What is it that you're working on? So one of the things that we, I shot in the last quarter of before I graduated, um, was a film called Air Traffic Control. It's about an air traffic controller that has to guide in a UFO. Um, oh. So it's about C a SeaTac air traffic controller that has to guide in the UFO without being able to talk to it. Yeah, 
Zero pair of parallel cross 216 left, 216 center line of weight, traffic will cross downfield. Line of 1068, cross 16 left, line of weight, one six center. 1068, The whole movie is an, an allegory for being another country and not knowing the language. Um, because it's like guiding it. It's like you're in another country and your car is on fire and can't communicate to the other person, where can I park my car that's on fire? Uh, so basically it's all about learning a new language and being okay um, with you know, not knowing what to do uh, and being uh, uncomfortable. Give our young audience some advice uh, if they're if they're thinking of pursuing film or VFX or animation. What should they do now? My advice for younger filmmakers and younger animators, and younger visual effects stars that are just starting out, is make something with what you have in front of you, um, whatever you can. Uh, that is the start down the road. Um, the first film I made was with Lego stop motions in my backyard. And I actually didn't even know there was stop motion. I thought there was an effect in the computer that you could drag and drop and it would instantly remove hands. <laughs> and I just, maybe there is, maybe there is now, man, if there's like a hand here, no, that, that would like completely it's crazy anyways. But like the, the thing I, I'd say is to just start making something. Don't do something because people are assigning it to you. Like if you're only doing something because it, it's homework because of a class and this is really any passion. Uh, any, any, whatever field you're doing, um, there's some, there needs to be something more than just someone's assigning this to you because sometimes in, in high school or in college, it's just like, all right, here's a, here's this assignment, jump through the hoop. However, school and classes are really, really helpful for people to have a guided environment to make these things. Um, because sometimes you can feel really small by yourself and then also enjoy the fun of making things like you're never a dull day. Like, um, Hundred percent. To make really, really good stuff, you also have to find your own voice, and the only way to do that is by making a lot of stuff, and then also making things you really, really care about. Hundred uh, percent with everything what you said. Uh, just some basic advice for people, for you guys, if you want to get into, you know, this industry is kind of tough, and it's very rewarding in terms of personal fulfillment, and you will make money if you're good at your craft. You you will make money or even more money than many other positions out there and occupations. So if you have family or friends who are telling you not to do and pursue film, art, animation, VFX, whatever it is, you know, and if you really want to do it, then I say just do it because you will not be able to prove to them if they've never done it, right? What you need to do is you need to surround yourself about with people like Blake, have that army of people in your own tribe that, you know, will motivate you to keep going. Because uh, like you said, you know, you need people around you that are like-minded. Uh, to, to move forward and what's more important is like you just need to take action a lot of people like you said Oh, they get all excited They watch all these things and they're like, oh, this would be great And then they go back start playing video games or you know not actually do anything about what it is that they want to do You know stay passionate. They start doing it today. Don't wait till tomorrow till the next day Do what Blake did in high school, you know start looking up uh, You know 3d software uh, start looking up cinematography Start looking up whatever it is that you think that you like use your gifts Jim Carrey's dad uh, really, really wanted to be an actor. He really, really wanted to be an actor, but he was, he was afraid and he, 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 he ended up not pursuing it and he, he was very regretful. And the thing he told to young Jim Carrey is just like, listen, you're gonna be better at the thing you're most passionate about. You're gonna go farther at the thing you care about the most. Th there are a lot of people that either talk down to art or just diminish what art does for society. And you know, when you're creating things and you care about it, your gifts will be taken and inspire other people. You'll go a lot farther at something you really care about and you're passionate about. It takes a lot of time. It takes some chaos because art is made out of chaos. Film is made out of chaos. And everything's made out of chaos. Um, but that's just life. You don't necessarily know exactly how the path is going to reveal itself to you. It, it's the act of continuously making that will reveal things that you never would have known. And your gifts actually do have importance, even though sometimes your family members might be like, like worried about financial security. Be like, okay, you should major in something not related to this. Um, and, and that's really, really tough because you're like, okay, which one do you choose? And um, I'll, I'll leave that to them. But it's like, you, eventually you're going to have to find your own path into this. A and that's how it kind of goes. Um, but know that always for, remember what your gifts are and, and never give those up and, and go out and make that thing. So thank you so much, Blake. <laughs> Uh, if you guys want to learn more about him or if you want to hire him for your next uh, film or uh, VFX project, head on over to BlakeRizzoFilm.com. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to talk about your film and you know give our audience 
a taste of what it's like to be a filmmaker slash self-taught VFX artist. As for you guys, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, make, make sure you click like, share, and click the notification button if you like this video. And we will see you guys in the next one. Thank you and bye-bye. Nobody can actually see what you're doing because the camera would be on me. <laughs> yeah, now, now they're going to see that.